Hey, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, my, my good friend, uh, Pastor Bradmeyer is back. How you doing? You know, I want to say that I'm doing good, but I am gimpy because of my knee surgery, and it is snowing for the 85th time in as many hours. It just doesn't want to quit up here. It's it's awful. I don't like it very much. You but uh, otherwise, things are going grumpy. good. That's, that's good. Hey, yeah. It's spring is coming. The days are getting longer. You know, it's just not as fast as I want it to be. Midwestern spring is even ruder than I am in traffic. It because it, 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 it'll just it'll tease you. It, it, it here's a wonderful, beautiful day, and the sun is shining, and then it's just gonna turn around and you know. dump four four feet of snow and be negative two, right? Mm-hmm. Up here. So, um, speaking of uh, upsetting things, uh, let let's have a fight with some atheists. How about that? Um, we, one of the things Boy, that we just, get to do. Yeah, you just love picking fights with people, don't you? I think they the started it. something about being quarrelsome, right? They start, well, I should, chief of sinners, something in Lent. I don't know. Jesus have mercy on me. Um, so so one of the back and forth, though, that, that, that we sort of go go around is, is sort of who has a, a superior position for moral authority. Uh, in other words, um, the, the Christians look down on um, the, the atheists because we, we say what you, you call morality, either you stole from the Ten Commandments, or you're making it up along the way because it feels good and it doesn't actually work all that well. You have no moral compass because you have no giver of 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 good, and they'll turn around and say you have no right to to claim sort of the higher moral ground when the God that you say is all good and all all loving kills kids. Uh, he he's murdered more people than the devil in the Bible. Uh, that that there's all of these 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 natural disasters that you say he's in control of. So clearly he is not good and his rules. I don't like them. I'm not I'm not joining your book club. How do we start to sort of sort through uh, who, who sort of has, uh, like, not the winning argument, but, but how, do we, how do we respond to this? Well, I think we have to be careful of a couple of things, because sometimes when we get into this fight, we point to ourselves. You know, we go, we, we Christians have the superior morality. And quite honestly, no one cares what I think about this, and no one cares what you think about this, nor should they. We care about what's actually right and wrong and what's actually good and what's actually bad. Right. And it doesn't matter if if I present it well or not. Right? You know, so real objective morality is the important thing. And so I don't want to get into these these, uh, you know, these contests where we have to see who's got the, the the better stack of moral qualifications, because that's a no win game. You know, I am a Lutheran. What do I believe then? I believe that we are all sinners by nature, which means if we get into this contest of laying out like who's got the better morality, we're all losers. There are no winners in this game. We all end up very deficient at the end of the day. Um, which is why, you know, I don't like to have that discussion. The question I think that we need to go back to if we're going to address this philosophically is, is there actually morality? Is there actually objective mm-hmm. right and wrong? And can we know it? And um, the options there are either yes or no. Right? There's no there's no in between. Yeah, no kind of a thing. And uh, the second thing that I like to do then is I like to also look at what the scriptures say about morality, because quite honestly, um, you can't really answer the question logically. You do have to go to where God has spoken and what he tells you about himself to figure out why God would do something like this and see if it's consistent with his character or not, right? Because we are told that God is good, that God is just, that God is merciful. And then you, you know, see like well, uh, Elisha and the, the kids, you know, they make fun of him from being a baldy and what happens? He, the bears Bear get sent out by God's power and there's a bunch of dead kids, you know, or Job loses his family or whatever, you know, there's, or like God tells the, the Israelites to kill all the Canaanites, you know? So this kind of stuff happens. And then, of course, the whole like, well, you know, God kills more people than the devil thing, which is, is honestly a ludicrous argument because the devil, first of all, is not God and therefore has no uh, ability or authority to actually bestow or take life. He just he is he's a creature like we are. And uh, if he takes life, that is just as much a violation of the divine law. Thou shall not murder as if you or I did it. Right. And the devil may be a lot of things, but, you know, he's uh, he's probably he's still scared of God because God is God and he is not just like we all ought to have fear of the Lord. So I guess those are kind of the the pieces of the puzzle. I guess we should probably do something to put them together a little bit. So I think before we take it apart, you know, one of the things you're supposed to do when doing philosophy is you take your opponent's argument and you try to give it in the best way that you can before you start disagreeing with it. You don't want to set up a straw man, right? Right. So um, this is specifically from a guy named Sam Harris. He wrote a book called The Moral Landscape. He's one of the new atheists. And he basically has two major points to what he calls a scientific ethic or a scientific morality. And he actually believes that ethics can be determined scientifically, that by um, by uh, looking at the world and doing scientific observations on it, we can come up with a determination of what is right and wrong. And the criteria that he uses to measure this 
is um, whether the outcomes are good or bad. So if more good things happen for people, then the action itself was moral and good. If more bad things happen, then it's bad. This is not quite identical with, but very similar to a view called utilitarianism, which is that moral actions are just measured by their effects, right? So it's consequentialism, you know, that we we care about the result. We don't really worry about the means to get there as long as what comes out of it is good. Now, if we compare that to Christianity, right? We don't just care about the effects. We also care about the means by which we get there. And we also care about the motivation by which this thing comes about. All of this matters because you can then it sin in thought, word, or deed, or even sin by doing a good thing that ends up blowing up in your face, right? This is this is the wonderful there. world that we live in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, these are the issues that we have. And um, sorry, I just got a package. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So this is this is this is what we have. This is the world we live in, and um, I think that's how we have to understand that. So he's bringing a different standard to the table than what you know we would be encouraged to think about as Christians, and uh, um, so I guess that's the two points that we have to look at. So the first point: Can ethics be determined scientifically? I don't think they can be de determined. There may be some type of observation of this, but not a determination of it. Just because you see something doesn't mean it automatically translates into a causal relationship. Or as another atheist, Scottish philosopher David Hume liked to say, this is called Hume's Law, by the way, that just because something is does not mean that you can derive from it an ought. And all that means is mm. if I observe something in the world, it doesn't mean there's a moral imperative to it necessarily. It could just be a thing that happened. So like, for example, if you look at certain animals, there's cannibalism. Does that then mean that we ought to practice cannibalism? Well, no, that's ridiculous. Why would we do that? And so Hume's law basically smashes the new atheist moral position just to pieces because their argument is basically there are things in the world, we look at them, and therefore we can derive from them moral pronouncements. And that is philosophically ridiculous because we can all think of things we've observed in the world amongst humans or amongst other animals that yeah. are just bad, right? And that we would never do them and they're completely unthinkable. Um, cannibalism, rape. You know, genocide. I mean, they're they're like species of ants. They'll go kill other ants off if they find them. You know, this stuff happens, and I don't think we really want to base our morality on that. It sounds pretty awful to me. Right. Uh, so, so even as Christians, we have this thing called natural law uh, that, mm -hmm. that we talk about every once in a while, where we say like you can sort of see evidence of how things ought to be in creation, but you also have to recognize there are places where that breaks down because there are ways that. Things ought to be, but we live in a fallen world, and so things aren't always going to work the way they ought to. That's the whole point of the right. fall. Um, right. So, so go ahead. I was going to say, but the thing about natural law, too, is that it's not empirical, right? It's based in mm -hmm. reason. So we, we may look at something that makes us think about it, but really where the law comes from is our reasoning upon reality and how people ought to act and the appropriateness or inappropriateness, the morality of an act is something that we actually reason through. And so it's not, I look at, you know, the anthill and how it fights the other anthill. It's that I you know, feel, I feel bad that the ants are killing this other smaller ants. Why do I feel bad about that? They're just ants. Who cares? Well, then I start reasoning about, you know, genocide and murder and what's right and what's appropriate and what justice means. And you can't, you can't just simply derive that by looking at the world. You actually have to sit and reason through it. Now, to be fair, Harris would say, you do have to sit and think and you have to reason. And it's not, you know, purely scientific in the sense that I just look at the world and it's that simple, but that's where you start with according to him. And and I don't think that we would quite go there. We would say that the natural law is something that we start with in reason, you know? So we actually start in reason about abstract principles of morality and then bring that to various things that we see in the world and apply it that way, rather than the methodology they're taking, which is to start with the phenomena, you know, the things that happen in the world and then reason backwards from that, which is how science works, but I don't think it works very well for morality. Right. So this is a cart and a horse kind of question then as, as, as to which comes first, because for us, uh, this is actually one of the problems of, well, who is it working best for? Um, because when I sin, I always am convinced it's going to work best for me. Um, and sometimes it, it does, but it works very, very poorly for my neighbor. Um, when when we, we get this sort of idea of us versus them, you, you already, I'm going to go ahead and say you lose the moral high ground if, if there's a them out there that's suffering so that you can do better. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, I'll just say yes. That's all I'm going to say to that. <laughs> so when, when we sort of have this, then I, I like sort of the, the idea of, of what are you starting with? Because then it, it's sort of like, well, um, people are better than God or people are worse than God it isn't really the thing that we're going to bicker over. But are you starting with the results? Or are you starting with with the idea? Um, and right. if you're only going to measure results, you're right, there are some things that at the time might seem like a good idea, but there are hospital wings dedicated to it seemed like a good idea at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, where, whereas for us, uh, we, we, we want to start with something simpler that, that we actually have a, a, a from on high revelation that 
there are things that are going to work better than others. So, you know, I, I like that you brought up natural law because um, I, I honestly think this is the strongest case for, for a Christian ethic or, or at least a, an ethic that can be philosophically demonstrated that's consistent with scripture, right? And natural law basically says, and I think the Bible backs this up because it talks about how God is truth and in him there's no falsity and so on and so forth. God doesn't act or speak against himself, right? If he says something is good, he's going to be consistent with that. He's not going to go against it. So when, you know, God says thou shalt not murder, he means thou shalt not take an innocent life, right? And so, um, you know, let's just say this is a common one atheists throw out there. Like, why does God kill babies? You know, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but why does God kill these people? Why does God do this? Well, that assumes a couple things. It assumes that I have a right before God to exist. Well, that's kind of a strange thing. I might have a right before the laws of the state or before my fellow man to exist. You know, so when we talk about like the right to life as Christians, that's the realm we put that in. But before God, we have to understand all life is a gift, whether that life is minutes long or, you know, 95 years. It's all a gift of God. And because it's something he bestows, it's his to be able to take back when he wants. And to assert otherwise is to deny the fact that we are not the originators of our life, right? It's It assumes that we're somehow responsible for our own existence and therefore have a right before the Almighty to demand that he give us a certain number of days. And that's just not true. I don't owe my own existence to myself. Nobody does. And so I can't claim a right to it in that way. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is to remember that... Um, you know, God does not forbid the use of the sword in uh, appropriate offices, right? So the police officer can actually use lethal force to stop a criminal. That is not ungodly. The soldier can defend his countrymen um, by, you know, shooting guys that are the enemy, right? That's not inappropriate. You know, a father can, and you know, shoot a trespasser in his house to defend his family who's, you know, causing harm. These things are all appropriate and good. Um, it doesn't make them murderers. It doesn't make them violators of the law because we would understand that, you know, that person should have probably died for the grade of something else. It doesn't make death a great thing, but it does make it a necessary thing in these cases. But see, it's isn't like, this just know, it though? We're, we're trying to be arbiters of death. And like even Job, which you referenced, like the, the book ends with God sort of reminding Job, you don't get to be that. And you might not like it, but the, the reason that you don't like it is because you're an idolater, that because you right. want to be God. And of course, all of us want to be God. And of course, nobody's going to like that we're not in control of death. Um, so so what we we are, are left with looking to is is not who is in charge and how can you wrest that from his, his control because you're never going to get it. But but rather, is is there a God out there who is working for good? That when God takes life, even takes life, is it is it for good? That's that's sort of the question, right? Right, and I think that um, well, if if Jesus is any indication at all of the character of God, which of course, if you're a Christian, you must say yes, or you're not because he's God, right? <laughs> because he is God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, if Jesus is any indication of this, right? What is God? What is God's answer to death? Is to die in death to undo death, right? It's to to destroy it by taking it captive to itself, you know. Um, that's a very interesting thing because the only, you know, a couple of the assumptions that go behind this besides that right to life is that God not only, um, wants to, but sort of has to intervene supernaturally in all cases where I think he should, you know, mm -hmm. like he should just pop up. Like when grandma has cancer, I like my grandma, do you, you know, God better do something about that. And if he doesn't, he's a big jerk. Well, why your grandma and not somebody else's grandma? You know, I mean, we all have to die someday. And, uh, why do we get to demand of God that it be in particular ways in a particular times. You know, this is why I like the litany. If you ever looked at that in our hymnal, you know, the litany ties that, you know, prays for a Christian end, you know, that we would die in faith and that it would be relatively pain-free and quick. I think that's a good thing to pray for, but uh, you know, when then, when and how that comes, isn't really up to us. Right. Well, I mean, it wasn't so far as we sinned, like the, the right. it wouldn't it be great if God just had no death, but well, we did that. Like right. if we're going to have any arbiters of death that that has to do with people, it's, it's when when we sinned. Um, well, that's the other thing, too, about this whole discussion that kind of frustrates me as a pastor is that there's zero culpability. Um, the atheist folks that argue against us really assume assume zero culpability on the part of human beings for all of this stuff in the world. Right. Because this is just natural processes. We had no no say in this in this death stuff. And I find it so bizarre that they get so angry about a God they assert does not exist and his character. Um which seems kind of strange given that they think that he's not real. Uh, the fact that they're mad at him implies that they do think he's real. They're just really mad at him. And then it's like a little kid that tells their parents, I hate you. and You're not my mom anymore. You know, or you're not my dad anymore. Well, you're still their mom or their dad, but they're just trying to hurt you. It comes across more like that than, than actual intellectual, um, you know, rebuttals of the, of the, of the Christian faith in, in defense of atheism. 
Um, and the other thing, you know, a couple other things too about this line of thinking that, that I think we can find objection with as Christians. Um, first of all, the idea that, you know, God's a big meanie head and kills people. And therefore, this is some kind of a re, you know, proper rebuttal to the Christian faith. Uh, this is kind of a, a universal acid, I think you could call it, that destroys any morality. Because if you point out that in any moral system, there are people who will act counter to it and that will make stupid decisions based on certain, the information that they have, because they may be ignorant, they may not see the whole picture, they may just be bad moral reasoners, Is mm -hmm. this works on anything. So if I were to say to an atheist, okay, um, here's a gun, shoot that guy over there. Um, and they, they just go, no, of course I wouldn't do that. And, and let's be honest here. What Christian, if, you know, you, if some spiritual being told you, Hey, go shoot that guy. What would you do as a Christian? Well, you go, yeah. well, but the Lord said mm -hmm. thou shall not kill. I can't do that. Right. So I don't care if you purport to be God or not. God doesn't lie against himself. I can't do that. Now let's say that I, I tell you the atheist, you know, okay, that guy over there. Well, actually it's uh 1937 and that's Hitler. Get him. Right. Go get him. And well, it, you know, most people would probably be pretty tempted by that. Does that make you any less a murderer? Does that make your action any more morally right? Not really. I mean, it might do some good in the world, but the point is, is that this idea just kind of corrodes everything because you will find weird exemptions. You will find things that people are more or less morally okay with that still violate the rules of your own system. Mm -hmm. right? Ethics is a much more complicated thing than we make it out to be, whether you're a Christian or an atheist. Right. So with this sort of in, in, in place, how do we rest assured that we actually have a decent moral reasoning when we look at the world as Christians? Because we're told that we're dumb and bigoted and small-minded and, and every other thing. So how can, we be, how can we be confident? Well, it all comes back to the character of our God, right? We're confident in him because he is good, right? And in him there is no darkness. He is truth and light. And all of these things that he gives are good. And if we just look at the things he provides and that he shows us that he provides every day, we see his character. And there's a testament to that in the fact that, you know, there's daily bread, that that even atheists, even people who despise God, wake up in the morning and have, you know, the blessings of life and food and shelter and all these things that God gives. So I think that's one way that we can talk about that. Um, the other thing is, is that we can just look at the character of what he teaches, the moral commands that he gives, right? So let's look at the moral law. And remember in, in the Old Testament, when you look there, there are three kinds of laws in the Old Testament, right? There's ceremonial laws that were designed to anticipate Christ and, you know, the sacrificial system in particular, anticipate Christ. There were civic laws that were designed to keep Israel kind of as a distinct people because the Messiah was supposed to come from them someday. And then there's the moral laws. And so the moral laws are the ones under question here, because typically when the atheists bring this stuff up, they bring up ceremonial laws, and civic laws, and use that to attack the moral laws when there is a major distinction between these three. Right. So when we look at the moral laws, what do we find there? Well, don't have idols. Don't orient, don't orient your life. I mean, just to, I'm going to make this kind of vague on purpose, but don't orient your life to things that kill you and hurt you and lead you into stupidity. Uh, that's, that's pretty good advice, even if you're not a Christian, right? Obviously, we would say, you know, obviously that's God ultimately, but, you know, that's not a bad advice. You know, uh, the second thing is don't don't use your language in, to hurt people, particularly those authorities that you look to for your protection, right? Third commandment, um, you need to spend time, you know, taking care of your spiritual needs, you know? And again, I'm being vague here on purpose. Are these bad things? I think most people would agree with these right. if I translated them in this way. Into obviously, pagan, yeah. for us Christian, they are more specific than that. But, you know, Gear, bear with me. Uh, having and protecting authorities, good thing. Don't kill people without cause, right? Um, get married, stay married, don't cheat on each other. Don't steal people's stuff. You know, don't speak ill of people, don't lie about them, don't gossip or slander. Don't want things that aren't yours. I mean, let's just look at those things. Are those immoral? Are they bad? Are they wrong? Are they wicked or evil? Right. I, you know, in fact, all of the Western morality that we have is based on these things, whether people want to admit it or not. Why? Why are Christian? Why is Western world charitable? Well, you know, you go to Asia, we, they don't practice charity like we do. Why are we charitable? Even non-believers give money in large degrees to charities compared to other parts of the world. Why do they do that? Because they have been taught by our culture that charity is a good thing. Well, where did that come from? Well, it came from this guy named Jesus who gave up his life for the world and taught us to do likewise, even at cost to ourselves. That's where that principle comes from. You can't find a good argument for that in nature. Maybe you can a little bit, but not to the degree that we're told to do it and that what we what we tell ourselves to do. You know, you just you just can't get away from it. So the moral framework that we operate in is by and large Christian in a general sense. You know what I mean? That in the vaguest way possible. Um, 
And that's, I mean, even because even, you know, Harris in his book more or less comes back to this general understanding of the world. Um, I don't know what you want me to say. I mean, it's just, it's just frustrating. Um, it's frustrating because when you talk to these folks, they they assume a bunch of stuff that's not true. They confuse things that don't need to be confused. And yeah, I just, it's, it's hard to deal with because there's a lot of, a lot of equivocations that take place. And so there's not real discussion that gets made. Usually, you know, the way it works is the Christian and the atheist start yelling at each other and that's about as far as it gets. And we don't have a real conversation, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Cause that's actually where, where we learn and grow. Right. And that's where we actually all come to the truth. Mm. You know, I mean, if I'm wrong, that's fine. But you know, I don't know that if you yell at me and I, you won't know that if I yell at you, we actually have to sit on a talk and reason together. That's how philosophy works. Yeah, I like it. So there's good stuff to think about. In fact, that was that was deep enough in the pool that that my brain's all wrinkly now. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, let, let's let's pause there and come back and and talk more about other philosophy stuff later. What do you think, man? I think that's good because uh, I think I'm all out of stuff to say anyway. Fantastic. Well, Pastor, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a good one.